Welcome, Motenta people. Non-serious attitude on the set was unbearable for Victor Fleming, and Judy Garland found that out in a horrible way. Why did Victor Fleming slap Judy Garland? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Motentos channel. Victor Fleming was the man who never compromised on work, despite having a darker side that was ingrained in Hollywood's rich history. According to Movie Predators, the seasoned filmmaker belonged to a powerful class of Hollywood directors in the 1930s known for intimidating actors to get the best performances. The New York Times describes Fleming as a garrulous, emotional man, going so far as to indulge in physical or verbal conflicts with performers on the set to acquire the performance he needed. Weird, right? But that was his strategy to get work done, and yes, it always yielded positive results. Victor Fleming was the man for hire, who could take any studio project and mold it into perfection, even if it was still a work in progress. Indeed, he was a diverse individual, with a good balance of toughness and tenderness, and a strong commitment to work. So why is Fleming so underappreciated and unpopular? Why did it take so long to appreciate Fleming? And for that, we needed to wait for Michael Schragow to publish his outstanding, thoroughly researched Victor Fleming, an American movie master, the first critical biography. Why? Let's find out in this video. Without Victor Fleming, the iconic 1939 movie The Wizard of Oz wouldn't have been the same. Fleming, the creative force behind Gone with the Wind, was known for writing and directing action films. He also had a strong personality and a passion for outdoor activities earning him the nickname Man's Director over the course of his four-decade career. During his time at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, he was regarded as one of the finest in the movie business, having won an Oscar and numerous other honors. However, the journey towards success was never easy for Fleming. Let's start with his struggling childhood. Victor Lonzo Fleming was born on February 23, 1889, in La Canada, California. When Victor was four years old, his father, a farmer of citrus, passed away. Victor moved in with his mother's brother, Ed Hartman, in San Dimas, an area east of Los Angeles, along with his mother and two younger sisters. Hartman also farmed citrus. Within a few years, Victor's mother remarried the owner of a wealthy water well, and that's how living for the family finally got improved. The young Victor loved being outside, working on his uncle's ranch, and practicing his shooting skills against gophers and rattlesnakes. He graduated from the Polytechnic High School in Los Angeles in 1905 at the age of 16. The young Fleming simply ignored the urging of his family to pursue a career as a teacher or a civil engineer. His earliest jobs mirrored his attraction to cars, which were then uncommon on California highways. He worked as a machinist for one of California's early motor businesses, White Cell and Company, in 1905. He later worked as a taxi driver and subsequently a mechanic for the Los Angeles Motor Car Company, a local mobile brand dealership. At Santa Monica in 1909, Fleming competed in his only known professional road race in a locomobile. He met the filmmaker Alan Dwan while working as a mechanic, and Dwan hired him as a camera assistant. He quickly attained the position of cinematographer, working alongside Dwan and D.W. Griffith. He joined Dwan in 1915 at the newly established Triangle Studios in New York where he once more worked for D.W. Griffiths on a variety of projects, including Intolerance in 1916 and other pictures starring Douglas Fairbanks. When America entered World War I in 1917, Fleming gained respect through his work with Fairbanks, which turned out to be of immense value. Fleming eventually served as Fairbanks' chief cameraman, and after enlisting in the Army Signal Corps in 1917 and joining the Photographic Division, he was given the responsibility of acting as President Woodrow Wilson's official photographer at the 1918 Peace Conference in Versailles, France. Prior to that, he produced instructional videos and worked in the military's Photographic Division. When he was demobilized, Fleming rejoined Fairbanks at the newly established United Artists, where he worked on the production of the studio's first film, His Majesty the American, in 1919. Later that year, he directed his first film, When the Clouds Rolled By, which starred Douglas Fairbanks. After directing Constance Talmadge in Mama's Affair in 1921, he established his reputation as a resourceful and capable director. His second film, The Molly Coddle, also featured Fairbanks. Fleming had a career that, while hardly ever spoken of, 
in the same glowing terms as many of his peers, had more high points than most of the canonized figures in critical and historical circles. He was a tough, unsentimental director who was not above mistreating his actors to get results. His real journey began as soon as he joined Paramount Pictures in 1922. He made a number of movies including Anna Ascends and To the Last Man and The Call of the Canyon, two Western adaptations of Zane Grey novels in 1923. The Zane Grey Westerns were huge commercial hits, and Fleming's reputation within the studio also grew. Code of the Sea, his next film, was credited as a Victor Fleming production in 1924. For the duration of the silent era, Fleming continued to produce high-caliber films for Paramount, including Empty Hands in 1924, Lord Jim in 1925, and The Way of All Flesh, and The Rough Riders in 1927. He continued to work in talkies and in 1929 directed Gary Cooper in his first great hit, The Virginian, before leaving Paramount. He contributed to Constance Bennett's success in the 1930 movie Common Clay, which was one of the most financially successful of the year. In 1932, he moved on to MGM, where he continued to build on his reputation as a trustworthy and creative handyman. He had a reputation for being a tough person who could take on the studios and get along with the performers, which led him to taking part in numerous unaccredited cleanup shots, such as the one for Red Dust, starring Gene Harlow and Clark Gable in 1932. He also oversaw Gene Harlow's successful performance in 1933's Bombshell. The remaining years of the decade were productive for Fleming, who produced several well-liked films. We can see he became somewhat of an expert at taking over projects and finishing them. In 1938, he directed a significant portion of The Great Waltz, replacing Julien Duvivier, who was given credit for the picture. After that, he took over and finished his two most well-known films, Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. Both are enduring products of Hollywood's golden age, so the question arises, why is he not given proper credit for his efforts in Hollywood? There are several explanations the first of which stems from the unusual way in which Fleming joined the problematic productions of The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind as MGM's go-to troubleshooter. He was a hired hand who often replaced other directors like Richard Thorpe and George Cukor during production. For crucial pictures, he also replaced uncredited directors like King Vador and Sam Wood. Thus, even if his legacy is preserved by these accomplishments alone, he is still regarded by many as an unsung hero. If we talk about The Wizard of Oz, Fleming replaced Richard Thorpe, who was the initial director when filming began in 1938. Richard was fired after only two weeks because the picture lacked a fantasy aspect. Following the temporary firing of George Cukor, Fleming took control and produced the joyful spectacle that still holds audiences' attention today. And yes, how can we forget about his anger issues? On the set of The Wizard of Oz, Fleming showed his tough side by slapping Judy Garland. Sounds shocking, right? But Judy Garland was definitely at fault for not being serious. Movie Predators claims that when 16-year-old Judy Garland repeatedly disrupted takes by giggling at the Cowardly Lion's performance, Fleming didn't just halt filming and reshoot the scene from the beginning, since this would have wasted precious time and money. She was removed from the set by Fleming, and then he slapped her across the face and yelled, Now go in there and work! While adding, now, dear, this is serious. Imagine if anything similar occurred on set today. Just imagine the panic. We can't help but wonder, what was so funny about the cowardly lion? According to Shregal, after the incident, Fleming reportedly felt bad about hitting Garland and began suggesting that someone on the crew punch him. Garland heard this and immediately said, I won't do that, but I'll kiss your nose, which she subsequently did. In the final movie, Garland can still be seen holding back her laughter. Despite being shocking by today's standards, Fleming's strict control and dedication to Oz kept the film from crumbling under the weight of its own ambitions, and as a result, a Hollywood classic was created. In the similarly troubled Gone with the Wind, there were at least eight writers, including Sidney Howard, the Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright who received just one credit, and five directors. Producer David O. Selznick removed Gone with the Wind's original director, George Cukor, soon after production got underway because he seemed lethargic and lacked a sense of the narrative. For Fleming, Gone with the Wind was a struggling experience. He was forced to leave the picture for nearly three weeks on doctor's orders after having a rumored nervous breakdown due to the constant stream of memos he was sending out, 
along with editing responsibilities on Oz in the evening while filming Gone with the Wind during the day, and a steady diet of vitamins and pills to keep up the schedule. During his departure, staff director Sam Wood took over directing, but Fleming returned to the big set to finish filming and help with the editing. In the end, he saved not one, but two of the finest pictures in cinema history from a total disaster. And the best director Oscar he won for Gone with the Wind was a tribute to the range of his abilities. But the strain of making the movies had a major negative impact on his health, and Fleming would only go on to direct a small number of movies afterward. He reconnected with Spencer Tracy for a 1941 remake of the Oscar-winning 1931 film Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which depended on the actor's skills to convey the shift from the benevolent doctor to his hideous alter ego instead of the groundbreaking makeup scene in the earlier movie. Since it did not turn out well, Fleming and Tracy promptly began work on Tortilla Flat, an adaptation by John Steinbeck. The Wizard of Oz himself, Frank Morgan, who won an Oscar for his portrayal of a compassionate dog owner, was the star of this light drama about the lives of Mexican-American fishermen in a small California town. Tracy's final project with Fleming was the lovely fantasy A Guy Named Joe, in which he played a pilot who tried to make the woman of his dreams happy from the afterlife by protecting her new love, Van Johnson, on a perilous Air Force tour. For the 1945 romance adventure about a rogue sailor who learned to settle down through his love for a librarian, Fleming reunited with Gable, who had just returned from active duty in World War II. He soon got to work on Joan of Arc, a 1948 biography of the French religious hero starring Ingrid Bergman. The director had a difficult time with the movie because of its lengthy two-plus-hour running time and the failed relationship with Bergman. Prior to its release, it was cut by about 45 minutes. Though it received mixed reviews and a low box office take, it received seven Oscar nominations and two wins for costume design and cinematography. Fleming, however, would pass away before the ceremony could take place on January 6, 1949, two months after the book's publication. With the exception of Oz and Gone with the Wind, which have become classics, his filmography got little appreciation for its range and consistency in the years that followed. Victor Fleming, American Movie Master, a book written by Michael Schregau in 2009, makes a strong argument for his standing as one of Hollywood's most accomplished and dynamic directors. But here, we need to think about the other side of Fleming. Was Victor Fleming more than just a trustworthy seasoned filmmaker going about his business invisibly and effectively? According to Schregau's biography, he was actually a very emotional person who was extremely dedicated to his work to the point where he frequently drove himself to the point of absolute physical and mental exhaustion. His problematic epic Joan of Arc, which he anticipated would exceed Gone with the Wind, but instead caused his death in 1949, was the ultimate example. He appears to have transformed his two 1939 films into personal commitments as a result of his 1931 second marriage, which made him a family man and devoted parent. In the narratives of Captain Courageous and Treasure Island, which are set in the world of men, he showed a tremendous deal of sensitivity for kids. He had his two young children in mind when he began writing Oz, a tale told through the eyes of the innocent young Dorothy. He requested that they see a picture that sought for beauty, decency, and love in the world in a letter to Mervyn Leroy, the film's producer. He brought to Gone with the Wind the losing side of the marriage, the deteriorating relations with his wife, Lou, so you can get an idea of the sensitive man behind the tough persona. Fleming had a deep knowledge of Scarlett and Rhett's complicated relationship, as well as the challenges faced by a confident longtime bachelor and well-known ladies' man as they adjust to a rebellious wife and a new way of life. In light of Schregau's book, it may be appropriate to revisit Fleming's body of work as we approach the 70th anniversary of the British premieres of his two most well-known films. In this place, The Wizard of Oz debuted in March 1940, while Gone with the Wind debuted there in April. The fact that the first was mostly written by a British author and that three of the four names above the title of the second were British was something that audiences took pride in. Indeed, both movies gave a struggling nation solace, joy, hope, and inspiration. Though he was being criticized for his controlling nature on the set, don't you think that he got the best out of his work due to his strictness? Let us know what you think about it. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Victor Fleming was not easy to work with, but how did others around him experience it? 
Why was Judy Garland forced to modify her body? Find out from this video.